And uh, today we are going to have uh, two eminent presenters. Uh, we will be discussing about circumcision in hemophilia. And we don't, we all know this is something that um, uh, has to be handled with uh, seriousness because if it's not, then the consequences are usually dire. The aspects shall be discussed in two formats. Uh, so we shall have the medical and lab aspect presented by Dr. Kibet. And then we shall also have the surgical aspect presented by one of our uh, surgeons, the urologist, Dr. Ikol. Um, so to start us off is Dr. Kibet, who is a consultant uh, at University of Nairobi and Kenyatta National Hospital. I think when we talk of hemophilia care in Kenya, um, it's hard to mention hemophilia without mentioning his name uh, because of the passion that he has had for this, uh, for people living with hemophilia, but also a lot of the achievements that have happened in the past uh, couple of years um, have really been due to efforts which he's been uh, championing towards accessing uh, factors to all patients really with hemophilia in Kenya. So without much ado, we are going to start with his presentation. I will encourage all the participants to use the Q&A section if you have any questions or any points of clarification. And thereafter, after each of the presentations, we will have a moment for question and answer session. So Dr. Kibet, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Terry. Um, can I have my slides back? Yes, that will be done. Nelson, are you able to assist us to have the Dakari slides projected? Thank Let you. Let me just share them back. I can do that from my end. So thank you, Dr. Matilda. Without uh, wasting too much time, I think uh, time has already gone. We could actually begin. Um, I'll attempt as much as possible to mention whatever may be of relevance to all of us, especially those of us who are managing this group of patients. And um, I'll uh, try as much as I can again to discuss based on our uh, you know, experiences within our borders. Um, so, so let me start by saying that circumcision uh, in hemophiliacs uh, is uh, among uh, some of the surgical processes uh, that are undertaken uh, in, 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 in any part of the world. And we know that circumcision is a very common procedure uh, performed by more than 80% uh, of the Kenyan population. And so, uh, as we all know, a uh, majority of the communities that circumcise that tend to circumcise males more than females, uh, but we also know that there are some scenarios where uh, females are circumcised just as much as uh, the males. And um, it's also important for me to mention this early uh, that uh, majority of the circumcision practices that are undertaken in our various setups uh, always involves blood. So some blood has to be lost. And um, unfortunately, with the disease that is of interest this afternoon, uh, blood is of essence uh, because uh, hemophilia is about the love to lose uh, blood. And so uh, when this blood is lost, uh, sometimes we end up with uh, bad outcomes and uh, some of those outcomes uh, can be fatal. Uh, but majority of the times, uh, you know, we've seen very good outcomes. And I think uh, the question would be, uh, is this uh, loss or fatality as a result of uh, bleeding? And, and I think uh, for those of us who've uh, visited different communities that sometimes circumcise 
we hear very interesting stories uh, on you know how you know clients are lost uh, or how these initiates are lost and uh, sometimes uh, the loss is never discussed uh, beyond possibly just informing uh, the parents and and so uh, this becomes a very important uh, question for us to discuss today and uh, we thought it would be nice for us to sensitize each other on the need uh, for us to prepare these patients uh, for any eventual uh, outcomes. And uh, we know that the circumcision practice worldwide could either be traditional or uh, medical in nature. Um, and as you can see in the photo there, you know, we have a traditional circumciser who apparently has a sharpened knife uh, in readiness uh, for his uh, initiates. So, uh, we know that in our setup here, a lot of uh, communities circumcise traditionally, and, and this also has affected the uh, hemophiliacs uh, broadly. So the question possibly would be, what is hemophilia? And I know a lot of times when we talk hemophilia, people have tended to ask, uh, you know, good questions, uh, sometimes hard questions. But we know that hemophilia is largely an inherited disorder. Uh, with a small percentage uh, where you know people can acquire. You are born normal, but then you end up acquiring uh, this bleeding disorder. And we see a lot of times uh, patients um, you know, that have acquired this disorder having been exposed to what we call danger signals. And I think uh, we may not belabor so much on that, uh, but we have scenarios where people have actually developed uh, hemophilia. Uh, the other thing Dr. is- uh, Yes. The slides are not moving. Oh, I don't sorry. able to put sorry. it in presentation. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Um, so we've lost but you are the able to see that slide, right? Okay, yes. That now we can see it. Are you able to put it in presentation mode? I had tried, and that's where you you know you indicated oh. that they were not moving. Unless right. okay. I get assisted from your from the other end. Do I just present from this board? Um, yes, if a uh, slideshow is going to be an issue, then uh, please carry on. Okay, thank you. So I was saying that um, hemophilia is largely an inherited disorder, but again, you know, we can get acquired uh, cases and uh, we've seen a few in our setup. Um, globally, uh, hemophilia is thought to be highly undiagnosed and 40.7% of uh, hemophiliacs may actually be found in our continent. Um, in Kenya, we should be expecting about 5,000 hemophiliacs uh, in our setup, but uh, we've only managed to reach about 800 and uh, possibly with the newer statistics, we may be headed towards 1,000. So we may be getting towards a 20% in terms of um, identification. And the majority of these are seen at Kenyatta National Hospital. So as a facility, uh, we need to be aware that we see a good number of patients uh, with bleeding disorders, especially hemophilia. The rest are distributed in other facilities. And I guess this explains why we have to capacity build um, other, uh, other treatment uh, or, uh, or health uh, care facilities to be able to see these patients. And so worldwide, we have about 324,000 uh, hemophiliacs or rather leaders uh, that need uh, this kind of care. If you look at the spectrum of bleeding in hemophiliacs, uh, hemophilia A uh, apparently is the commonest, uh, accounting for about 80% in our setup. And this particular uh, picture is seen worldwide. Uh, majority of the patients with hemophilia tend to be hemophilia A. These are factor eight deficient uh, patients. Uh, hemophilia B would lack uh, factor nine. And so um, in our setups, uh, we need to prepare more for hemophilia A than hemophilia B. But again, in terms of uh, clinical presentation, uh, they both present uh, you know, in a similar fashion. Von Willebrand disease in our setup is um, not uh, widely identified, yet this is the commonest disease 1% of our population should actually be having von Willebrand disease. And having five only in our setup is, is a disadvantage. It simply means we are not working harder uh, to look for these patients. And I think uh, it will take concerted efforts for all of us to actively look for these patients and uh, possibly enroll them. We also have a few 
uh, factor deficiencies like, like factor seven, sometimes combined with factor 10. Uh, in our database, now we have one being followed up at Kenyatta National Hospital, and then we have another uh, acquired either through a liver failure or uh, an acquired hemophilia A. And uh, these are all cases uh, that are actually being followed up at uh, Kenyatta National uh, Hospital. If you look at uh, the bleeding uh, patterns, as I did mention, um, of importance is that you'll always hear of a history of hemorrhage that tends to be disproportionate to trauma. And uh, one of the things that I've noted about these patients, and we all might agree, is that when you are performing any procedure on them, you'll not see blood gushing out. But there'll be a slow but very faithful loss of blood. You would hardly see blood that threatens you as a surgeon or blood that threatens you while you're attending to this patient. But sooner or later, you'll see whatever dressings you've used soaked and literally falling off. So the kind of hemorrhage is quite disproportionate um, and, and can be lying to the eye. So we, we have to be a little uh, careful. And so the history of hemorrhage might be very critical. And sometimes you have to take a little more of time uh, to identify these clients. Uh, the bleeding can be spontaneous, and uh, the spontaneity of uh, the bleed is not necessarily commensurate to uh, the severity of the disease. Uh, we know that uh, severe hemophiliacs have less than 1% of the factor uh, within circulation, uh, but it's not always true that these are the only groups that would have spontaneous bleeds, versus those that may have induced bleeds. Majority of the times, uh, you would tend to see the, the milder forms, uh, you know, manifesting during a surgical intervention or when they have some excess trauma, you know, including possibly uh, accidents that could potentially bring them to hospital. Um, and so that family history becomes uh, excessively important. The other thing that you would tend to see, though this, uh, uh, you know, can, has been demystified lately uh, with a few cases that we've seen at KNH is that the bleeds start as early as infancy. And so when you look at the history of a bleeder, you know, you, you possibly may be having some bleeding sessions across their lives right from infancy to, you know, their adulthood and, and subsequently in aging. Uh, the other day we had a 71 or they about a year old who presented with an intracranial bleed and apparently was a mild uh, bleeder. And so this can actually stay for as long as, uh, you know, um, at, at an elderly stage uh, when it manifests. And, and so we should be able to, uh, you know, attend to these clients at whatever stage of uh, presentation in, in, in our clinics or in our setups. Um, and as uh, we may have uh, noted, um, the type of bleeds are heavily dependent and including also the types of interventions are heavily dependent on the severity of the bleeds. Majority of the patients, as I did mention, tend to be severe, and severe hemophiliacs have factor levels less than 1%. Then we have a moderate group uh, that would have some little factor of up to 5%. And then the milder forms uh, would potentially have factor levels ranging from about 6 to, to, to about 40%. Uh, anybody who is uh, normal would tend to have factor levels more than uh, 50%. Uh, to, you know, about 150%. And then those that tend to be thrombotic would have higher values of factor levels. So uh, knowing and determining the severity of the bleeder is uh, essential because it will assist you heavily in determining uh, the type of uh, medical products that you might, might, you might use, including um, any other support structures that might be required. Having said that then, uh, let me try to focus a little more now on uh, preparation for our patients uh, for circumcision, because this is a key surgical procedure that we may potentially struggle with, especially for our surgical colleagues, uh, because uh, this is a holiday, it's a long holiday, and the chances are that a lot of our patients may be coming in this time. So one of the things we thought we needed to do is uh, to make sure we do some uh, preparations. So circumcision is among the inevitables in our setup, and planning is key. Um, and, and I think uh, of importance, again, is that uh, we need us as medics to start preparing ourselves uh, with information that can guide us, because we've also seen uh, cases coming in with complications that were actually attended to by our colleagues in the peripheries. 
And I don't need to blame them, neither should any one of us, uh, because they can only do the much they can. And sometimes patients hide information uh, when uh, they visit our colleagues uh, in the peripheries. So complications become a high priority to us and a big possibility. But of importance really is uh, how do we identify or diagnose uh, these patients, especially the moment they come in with complications, because that will heavily support us in uh, you know, uh, guiding uh, treatment um, or management that is sometimes very specific and uh, may warrant a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, having said this then, uh, what are some of the possible complications that we can see? Apparently, sometimes we've seen uh, complications that are life-threatening and, and these are mainly associated with the bleeds. Patients have lost uh, too much blood to the extent that uh, you know, they come to us when they're in shock. The other one is we've seen a lot of misdiagnosed patients uh, being taken to theater. Uh, a patient who is hemophilia A is taken in as hemophilia B, uh, or a hemophilia B patient uh, being taken into theater as a hemophilia A patient. And, and so misdiagnosis has uh, been a big problem. Mismanagement of these clients also has been a mega factor. Um, and I think uh, this is heavily driven by the lack of the appropriate uh, treatment products. Um, to the extent that uh, we always uh, prefer when we talk to each other, uh, we plan together where we can, we want to support our colleagues wherever they are so that they have successful outcomes. Um, the other key thing is uh, the multiple factor deficiencies that we sometimes see in patients. You can get a hemophilic uh, that is also a von Willebrand uh, factor deficient patient or a von Willebrand that has developed inhibitors. Uh, to factor eight. And so you have a combination of uh, factor deficiencies. And um, we've seen this in the factor seven, factor eight deficient patient coming at, to Kenyatta National Hospital for care. So multiple factor deficiencies can really be um, a nightmare and it would just be nice for us to uh, identify that. And then of course the bigger headache uh, the, and the bigger elephant in the room is uh, patients developing inhibitors. And inhibitors are mainly antibodies that are produced against uh, coagulation factors. We've seen scenarios uh, where patients uh, who are being managed uh, for these bleeding disorders, you know, developing antibodies actually against the products that we are using. Uh, we also have seen scenarios where patients uh, get exposed to clotting factor concentrates as a mode of treatment and they end up developing antibodies towards the same clotting factors. And so, a mild bleeder then ends up behaving like a, you know, a severe bleeder because antibodies have developed. Hello? Terry, we can hear you now. Yes, thank you. Um, you lost me a little? Yes, uh, from the point where you said antibodies have developed when you're talking about inhibitors. So okay, the thank you. Thank yeah, you. Patients with uh, you can see the slides? Yes, we can. Okay, because, um, sorry, my screen is not moving. Let me just see if I can. Okay. Uh, Dr. Rib, it's okay. I realize that uh, the slides are now being shared for you. Can you see them? Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can see them. Um, so. Okay. Patients with inhibitors, um, you know, are patients that develop antibodies uh, towards uh, factor eight or factor nine, and they, they can also develop against any other clotting factor. So patients with antibodies can be a big challenge, again, because the approach to care tends to change heavily. Um, and, and we would have to identify the appropriate products, uh, one in our setup, and also, uh, you know, trying to source from other areas, uh, should we, uh, get into this uh, group of patients. Um, the other thing is uh, we sometimes have uh, uncoordinated care uh, where we have apathy from clinicians um, and you know that, that causes problems. But I think uh, the, the support we've had so far has been very uh, good. Um, and I think I can only applaud uh, the team uh, and, and majority of us that have been supporting this group of patients. Uh, right from Kenyatta National Hospital and I guess uh, within our borders. Next slide. Can I get the next slide? Thank you. 
And, and so these complications, uh, sorry, next slide, please. Yeah, so I want to just note that the complications we see might range from the areas where bleeds are common, uh, which are mainly within the joints. And uh, we've seen scenarios where, you know, clinicians have, uh, you know, gone ahead to do arthroplasties on uh, joints that have uh, that are swollen, uh, thinking that possibly they are dealing with the sepsis or some um, arthritis, septic arthritis. And, and they end up with the bleeds. Um, and, and you know, this is one example that I possibly prefer showing sometimes. And uh, we saw this patient uh, at KNH having been uh, manipulated elsewhere. And uh, the patient now has ended up with very severe contractures, but we thank God our surgeons were able to intervene and did grafting. Um, and, and of course uh, the patient has uh, recovered, uh, but then with uh, very serious uh, complications. Next slide. Um, and we can get now complications that are specific to circumcision. Um, and, and some of these uh, complications uh, are usually associated and, and heavily driven by uh, bleeds uh, that become so threatening to the surgeons uh, to the extent that they fear managing the patient up and above what they'll have done. And uh, what you see, uh, which may sound a bit scary, and forgive me for those of us uh, who may not be very familiar with this particular area, are patients that come to us uh, with, with septic, uh, you know, surgical uh, procedures, especially after circumcision. And you can see uh, the skin has given way with retraction and you end up with a heavy wound or a big wound uh, that sometimes uh, makes us worry. Because when we see this kind of um, uh, procedures uh, that, have gone, uh, that have gone sour or complicated, uh, patients tend to develop antibodies. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, antibody development in patients post-surgery is a very common event. And we tend to watch this by the 10th day because surgery is among uh, what we call danger signals in patients with bleeding disorders. Other danger signals include uh, you know, infections. And so if you have an infection on top of a surgical procedure, you basically double the risks uh, of uh, developing antibodies. And so even having a corrective procedure after this becomes a key problem because you may not even have adequate skin, especially if a portion of it has become gangrenous um, to even correct uh, or, or, you know, to try and then close the wound. So um, I think getting it right really is, is, is very important. And so, uh, you know, this particular patient was a referral from one of our peripheries. And, 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 and again, I think uh, this, uh, emphasizes the need for us to have this conversation. Next slide. Um, so, so really the essence of us having this particular presentation is for you to appreciate what planned circumcision with factor concentrate ends up you know, giving. A very clean wound. You know, on, on my left uh, is a young boy who was uh, nicely planned for this particular procedure. You know, we had factor infused and the boy healed pretty well compared to a patient who was uh, seen out there without any factor being infused, ended up with a huge hematoma that gave way, uh, but thank God we were able to uh, attend to this patient with our colleagues and, and we managed to have this corrected and, and so the patient was able to go home. For the second patient, uh, we ended up developing antibodies uh, because of uh, you know, this exposure of the wound and um, we still were able to get appropriate uh, treatment products uh, to support the patient. Next slide. So I think uh, key at this particular point is for us then to discuss very quickly on the inevitables. And this is about uh, circumcision. I know, uh, you know, vaccinations against COVID have also been a big discussion and more so surgical procedures uh, that these patients may have or may require including any interventions, interventions after trauma. We've seen patients coming to the hospital either after trauma, you know, they were involved in a road accident and they need some corrective procedure. Uh, and the reason why I'm bringing this on board is because we can actually combine some procedures in these patients. A patient who requires a surgical procedure who is a bleeder coming, let's say, for a corrective procedure who is uncircumcised and would like to be circumcised can have these two coupled together. So we can do multiple procedures on these patients, including circumcision, uh, when they come in uh, under, you know, for different procedures. Next slide. 
Next slide, please. So uh, the approach for us at Kenyatta National Hospital, because I'll try to use what we are doing right now uh, as a basis, as a foundation, as a baseline for us to possibly very quickly uh, prepare our patients, especially for colleagues in the peripheries. Uh, one of the things we have been trying to do is to invite these bleeders into the clinic um, and review them three to five days uh, before admission. Uh, so that then you can make an assessment of you know, their clinical status and start preparing them even psychologically for this procedure. Of importance for me to mention is that uh, this is not among the routine uh, procedures that we do. So uh, to support these patients, let us admit them as medical surgical procedures uh, that warrant some medical intervention. Because when it comes to support in terms of finances by NHIF, if we don't indicate this as a medical requirement, then uh, patients uh, get distressed. The other reason why we bring them on board is because we want to prepare them by running the routine blood works. And of importance is for us to repeat a coagulation screen. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a big problem in a lot of places. People have tended to rely on INR. INR will never identify a bleeder for you, especially a bleeder with hemophilia because a lot of hemophiliacs have abnormalities affecting the intrinsic pathway where APTT is of importance. If you do INR alone, if you do PT INR, one of the things you will do is you'll have excluded a big chunk of hemophiliacs uh, from uh, being identified. And so routine coagulation screen for a full APTT and a PT would be more preferred. And of course, uh, for us to determine whether these are patients who are born with this bleeding disorder, we do mixing studies. And I'll explain that a little later, uh, and more so for patients that have already been diagnosed, being followed up in our clinic at Kenyatta National Hospital, we screen them for inhibitors. Um, so an inhibitor assay is important. And I think uh, one of the things uh, we would like to do for our colleagues in the peripheries is to support them through inhibitor screening, and we can provide this uh, you know, at whichever level. Um, having said that, next slide, please. Is um, what do we do, especially for invasive procedures that include circumcision? As I did mention, where possible, try to do an inhibitor screen, where possible. If it is not possible, then one of the things we recommend you could do, if you can access an APTT, is to do a mixing study, which I'll explain a little later, but basically the concept around uh, a mixing study is for the lab to take the patient's sample and mix with, the, uh, with, with normal plasma and repeat the APTT to see whether there's a correction. And using that, uh, you know, simplistically, we can be able to say there is no antibody or there is an antibody. The other thing is uh, we have to prepare sufficient amount of products to prevent and manage bleeding. Um, previously, in Kenyatta National Hospital, when we received patients that had complicated, we were spending up to a tune of 700,000 Kenya shillings worth of factor concentrates. Now, those are enormous amounts of factors, and we can avoid spending these amounts of factors. And I think uh, with this new exercise that we are undertaking, we shall be able to conclusively and they fairly uh, you know, advise all of us on the amount of factor that we can use for a routine case uh, coming into our set centers. We also have to assess these people or these patients uh, for a pre-procedure and, and potentially do a rehabilitation plan and a recovery plan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, these are not routine patients as I did mention, and so their hospital stay tends to be a little longer. One of the observations we've had through some pilot programs, uh, circumcision programs uh, at KNH is that these patients can stay in the ward, especially for adults between seven to 10 days. I think the shortest has been about five days. But for, adult, for, patient, for children, uh, for the pediatric population, they can stay for between 10 to 14 days, sometimes even up to three weeks. So these are patients that we have to prepare and figure out how to rehabilitate um, in case of any complications. And then the other thing, obviously, is it's always good to have a protocol that you follow uh, when you are preparing these patients. Whether vaccinations are necessary or unnecessary 
uh, it may be debatable. But uh, again, you know, these are patients uh, that should be treated like any other uh, patient uh, we see in our surgical uh, setups. Uh, next slide. So uh, we plan to circumcise, as I did mention, about uh, 100 plus uh, patients that have been registered this year. And um, you know, this uh, procedure should be performed by experienced colleagues. I think right now we have split our procedures between the pediatricians, the pediatric surgeons, and the adult surgeons. Um, and and you know, one of the things that we are doing is we do a preliminary factor dose, uh, you know, we that we give. And the intention really is to give, uh, you know, to cover these patients between 80 to 100 percent. Um, just for the sake of this discussion, for you to cover appropriately uh, these patients, uh, we prefer that you do 80% uh, cover, uh, but we can also come down to 60%. And uh, in terms of dosing, uh, the dosages vary based on the type of factor concentrates that we give, and the durations or the frequencies uh, are also determined by the type of factor concentrates that we give. Majority of the times, uh, we have been using what we call extended half-life uh, factor concentrates that can stay in the body for at least uh, four days, uh, but this does not dictate the frequency of dosing. Uh, for us to be safe, we have tended to give factor concentrates on a daily basis and they possibly scatter gradually as we assess uh, the wounds. For factor eight, uh, we, for us to, to cover 80%, uh, we do 40 international units per kg because one international unit of factor eight increases your factor uh, concentration level by 2%. And so, uh, you know, an international unit per kg will give you 2% activity. Uh, so if you want to do 80%, you can give 40 IU per kg, or if you want to do 100%, then you do 50 IU per kg. Uh, for factor nine, uh, one international uh, unit uh, gives you 1% uh, activity. And so for every kilogram, we replace with a unit. If you want to do 80% activity, uh, you know, cover, then you do 80 international units per kilogram. Uh, of importance also is for us to ensure that there is uh, adequate achievement of hemostasis uh, locally. Uh, because anytime you don't achieve that, then you're likely to develop uh, hematomas. Um, and then the other thing, and I guess Dr. Ari will talk about, is the type of sutures uh, that may be required. Um, for these particular patients, uh, we would wish that we prepare factor concentrates for the entire operation, operation cycle or, or, or period. And we give factor three days uh, after a minor procedure. And, and of course, uh, circumcision is taken to be a minor procedure. We don't take this to be a major procedure. But if you combine procedures, which can happen even for this particular group of patients, as I did mention, we've seen patients with hernias uh, going for aneurysms. Uh, we then convert a minor procedure like circumcision into a major procedure. And we have to cover the factor concentrates for a little longer. Uh, between seven to 10 days, and sometimes we stretch further. Hello? I've lost my slides. We can hear you, Dr. Tari. Let me ask the technical team to assist us. Matilda, is someone sharing the slides or I try? We are trying to rectify this. Just one minute. Maybe as, you, as we wait for this to be addressed, there was a question about why circumcision at all, as it should be contraindicated for this patient group. Maybe you can comment on that as we try and fix the slides. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ari. Um, so yes, I guess the easier route to follow is uh, to make this a contraindication. But we all know that uh, circumcision to some communities is a must have. And we have to prepare ourselves as uh, clinicians, uh, you know, to support this group of patients. And, um, you know, if you look at different cultures uh, for the Muslims, for example, 
uh, they circumcise uh, quite early, uh, while other communities would tend to wait a little longer. Um, and, and so it's, I think it is just good that if we have the facilities and uh, we have the opportunity to give these people a life to live, then I think it would be better that we prepare ourselves to circumcise them uh, where appropriate. Um, uh, we've seen uh, a 63 year old uh, seeking circumcision. Um, and and uh, you know, that tells you, uh, you know, what sometimes happens. And, and we also know that uh, there can be a lot of pressure within our communities uh, to have circumcision uh, done. Um, so uh, I, I think the safer thing uh, at this point for us to do is uh, possibly to prepare them and give them a safe uh, procedure rather than wait uh, for people to mess them up uh, out there. I hope that helps. Thanks, Dr. Tari. Can you see the slides? Yes, I can see the slides. Um, so I can proceed if that is okay. Yes, yes please. Thank you. So um, the other thing is uh, we need to monitor these patients uh, after surgery for inhibitors. And uh, this is done at a frequency of four to 12 weeks after the procedure. And the reason why we do this, as I did mention, is uh, our observation in our setup is that by the 10th day, uh, patients that develop inhibitors can easily come up with uh, these antibodies. And so when you infuse factor concentrates, they can actually, uh, if they are to bleed, they will continue bleeding. And that can be a good sign of uh, inhibitor development when you give factor and they are not responding. Uh, I'll leave the anesthetic aspect uh, to our colleagues uh, to talk about, but we don't recommend uh, spinal anesthesia because uh, you know these patients can have uh, intrathecal uh, bleeds. Next slide. So um, I want to then shift gears and uh, very quickly talk about uh, inhibitors. And uh, one of the key products that uh, we are currently using, and I'll not be labor so much to talk about this particular product, uh, it's called a Milibra or uh, a monoclonal called a Misuzumab, uh, which is actually available in our setup. We shall not use it. Uh, we shall not recommend it at this particular point for circumcision, but it is a monoclonal antibody that, has, uh, that is newly in the market. It's very costly. It's almost a million shillings uh, per infusion. Um, so uh, we are only recommending this for patients uh, that have antibodies and uh, we, or intracranial bleeds that may be severe uh, or life-threatening uh, and, and warrants us to intervene. Uh, we have about 60 patients now in country that are, that are benefiting from this particular product. Uh, majority of the patients with inhibitors are uh, supported through a product called FABA. FABA stands for factor eight inhibitor bypassing agent. And we don't combine these products uh, anytime we have uh, patients with inhibitors. So I am passing this message up front uh, so that then when we get patients and we have the privilege to use this product, uh, please uh, be aware that uh, you don't combine both. We can only use one or the other. Next slide um, for the sake of time. Um, the other uh, issue is uh, this is the algorithm uh, that we tend to follow when we are managing patients with inhibitors. And I don't want to belabor uh, on this because I'll talk about uh, inhibitors shortly. Next slide. So I want to shift gears very quickly and very briefly to talk about uh, the role of the lab, especially for those of us who are supporting these patients. Majority of the times, uh, you know, we do the routine coagulation assays. Uh, so that we can determine uh, the factor that is, uh, that is, uh, that is missing. Um, but then we can also go further and uh, determine the amount of uh, factor that is missing uh, in these patients. But I think overally, for uh, some of these uh, factors uh, that are missing, we prefer that we do mixing uh, assays. And uh, the mixing assays uh, are very easy to set up. I think for majority of the sites, uh, we've developed this capacity, uh, both at Kenyatta National Hospital and in other places. Uh, and of importance really for us is to do at a bare minimum a PT and an APTT, so that then you can determine where the abnormality uh, truly lies. Thereafter, you can then use different types of uh, plasma uh, to determine what is missing. And uh, this type of plasma is said to be factor deficient plasma. Um, and, and we use this uh, to identify abnormalities uh, 
uh, that may be associated with the bleeds. Um, but overall, we also use normal plasma to determine whether it is a coagulation factor deficiency or not. Uh, because if it is a coagulation factor deficiency, then you would get some correction. Uh, next slide. Um, when it comes to factor assays, as I did mention, this is very important uh, because uh, the amount of factor in circulation enables us to determine and plan for the amount of factors that we shall use and the approach uh, to care. Mild bleeders can actually be circumcised with almost no factor concentrates. And I've seen scenarios where patients uh, with mild uh, forms being circumcised under tranexamic acid or with little uh, fresh frozen plasma. So factor assays are a key uh, component uh, anytime uh, we are preparing these patients uh, for surgery. And uh, you know, the results uh, for the factor assays will be uh, you know, expressed as a percentage of the normal plasma. And so classifying your patient uh, using factor assays uh, is easy. And we prefer that anytime you are preparing these patients, uh, try to determine their factor assays. Next slide. So the normal levels are between 50 and 150, as I did mention, uh, don't change the slide uh, because uh, uh, this will be the next, don't change the slide, move to the next slide, thank you. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the, the thing is uh, how to suspect an inhibitor, as I did mention, is that uh, the bleeding tends to continue. You are unable to control a bleed on time with the usual dose of factor. Uh, the second thing is when you try to do your mixing studies, you do not end up with a correction. And that is an easier way of telling whether someone has an inhibitor. And uh, as I did mention, persons with the hemophilia A, especially the mild type, tend to develop inhibitors more than the moderate or the milder forms. And uh, you can also sometimes uh, get factors, uh, factor uh, inhibitors uh, developing uh, based on families. Um, just for information purposes, again, we've seen a lot of inhibitor patients coming from the side of uh, some regions in this country, let me not mention, uh, so that then we don't um, uh, start uh, classifying clients. Uh, and then of course, race. It is heavily said that uh, the black race uh, tends to have more inhibitors than any other uh, races. Uh, but I, I guess this is because we've not really heavily studied our clients and that might be an opportunity for us to see what their behavior looks like. Next slide. Um, I'll not be labor on this uh, next slide because these are just mixing studies where we take normal plasma and abnormal plasma and see whether these are correction. I think of importance for me, and I'll just mention this next slide, um, try to move to the next slide, is for us to be able to test patients uh, for inhibitors. We have different assays that we can use. The Bethesda assay is the commonest uh, in our setup. We have a modified Bethesda that is called Nijimegan. And then other tests that can actually be applied is ELISA, fluorescent-based amino assay. Next slide. We can also do pharmacokinetic studies and um, any other slide. And so just to mention very briefly on the Bethesda assay is that, um, uh, you know, a Bethesda unit. Go to the next slide, please. Basically for us to interpret the Bethesda assay, uh, keep going, I'll tell you when to stop. You can, you can stop there a little. So for us to be able to use this particular assay, which is uh, available within our setup, it's actually available in Kenya, uh, just to, you know, to, to communicate this, is that when a patient develops an antibody, the intention is for us to determine the amount of antibody within an amount of blood or plasma uh, that assists us to decide whether we shall manage this patient or not. And one Bethesda unit, anytime you get a Bethesda unit, which is given in BU, is the amount of inhibitor that reduces half of the factor eight activity in a mixture. So if I get one Bethesda unit, it means I've left, uh, sorry, I've lost uh, you know, factor eight activity by 50%. So anytime I have a Bethesda unit, I know 50% of factor eight activity is gone. Next slide. And we are able to demonstrate this. Yes, next. We are able to demonstrate this by stating that if I have lost some amount of activity, I can demonstrate in the lab through dilutions. And uh, the amount of di diluent that I use 
um, either to correct that uh, is equivalent to the number of Bethesda units uh, within that particular sample. And I think uh, the most critical statement I need to make is that anytime you have a single Bethesda unit, you have lost almost 50%. Uh, By the time you are getting to two Bethesda units, you've lost a large amount of factor uh, you know, in, 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 in circulation. And, and so the amount of antibodies would be, would be quite high. And to the extent that even if you tried overwhelming uh, these antibodies with factor concentrates, you would have to use large quantities. Next slide. Okay, so based on the number of Bethesda units, we are able to classify patients into two major groups. Um, you can get those that are said to be lower, lower titer uh, inhibitor patients, and these are patients with less than five Bethesda units, or high titer inhibitor patients, those having more than five Bethesda units. For those with lower than five Bethesda units, we can try as much as we can to overwhelm with um, factor eight uh, or um, you know, give uh, bypassing agents, while those with higher inhibitor titer levels would require bypassing agents. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, these are just uh, you know, um, other methods. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Uh, ELISA is also another technique that we could use. Uh, possibly I'll not waste too much time on this. Next slide. Next slide. So we can also do pharmacodynamic studies. Again, I'll not be labor on this just to determine the amount of inhibitors. And we have four types, sorry, two types. Um, next slide, please. I notice time is moving. And I think I've already classified our patients into low titer and high titer. Uh, sometimes we have uh, subclassified this into the high responders or low responders, uh, you know, depending on how fast you can clear an inhibitor. Next slide. Just keep going. And this is a, an algorithm uh, that we use um, to determine whether someone has an inhibitor or not. Keep moving um, because I want to bring my discussion to a close for me to allow my colleague to speak. So basically, these are methods we can use uh, to identify patients with inhibitors. Um, finally, next slide. Next slide. We should attempt as much as possible to work together as a team. This is my last slide, uh, ladies and gentlemen, because care to patients with bleeding disorders require a multidisciplinary approach. And I think I've just mentioned some of the disciplines that we might use or need as we move along with care. Um, and I think I'll leave my presentation at that. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Dr. Tari. Um, and due to time, uh, thanks for the people who posted their questions in the Q&A session. We are going to address that. But allow me at this juncture to introduce Dr. Ikol, uh, who's a consultant a urologist at the Kenyatta National Hospital and has also been very key in terms of uh, working towards uh, developing a safe circumcision protocol for our patients. So Dr. Tari, um, welcome to give your talk and we shall address the questions uh, after this. Uh, we can see your slide. Yes. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can, Dr. Tari. Tari. Okay, I have also have the freeze problem. Okay, good. So I'm going to speak about the surgical aspects of uh, male circumcision. Uh, as an introduction, uh, basically circumcision is the surgical removal of the foreskin. Uh, scientifically, we refer to it as the prepuce, either in whole or in part. You will find that uh, those who have uh, examined male genitals will find in some situations you have people who look like they are partially circumcised. It's good to note that 
It is a common surgical procedure which is performed in males and indeed in some communities, routine circumcision is practiced uh, basically for religious or cultural grounds. Historically, uh, circumcision started 15,000 years ago, which is a long time ago. Um, this was mainly for religious and ritualistic purposes. However, it was only medicalized in the 19th century. Uh, globally, around 33% or a third of the male population is circumcised. The rates of circumcision vary in different uh, communities. You'll find in the United States, around 70% of the male population is circumcised, while uh, in Britain, uh, only 6%. Back home, we find the Nigeria and Kenya having around the same rates, around 80, 84 to 87%. It is good to note that uh, there are actually very rare medical indications for circumcision, both in prepubertal pre boys and uh, males. However, there are relative indications for circumcision, but the evidence does not suggest that there is much benefit uh, for circumcision. And how that's how come the question which was earlier posted on the chat box, is it necessary to circumcise? There is still controversy on the health risks of preserving an intact foreskin because there is lack of uh, proper evidence or clear randomized trials to indicate the clear advantage of circumcision. It is good to note also that uh, there are a number of complications associated with circumcision, uh, which have been very well documented. Uh, looking at uh, some of the medical reasons for circumcision, there's a landmark observational study which showed that there is a lower prevalence rate of HIV in uh, sub-Saharan Africa among populations that have a high circumcision rate versus those that have a lower circumcision rate. In Kenya, for example, we have a high circumcision rate of above 80%, and our prevalence of HIV is only around uh, 6.1. And if you look at the other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, it hovers around between one and 10% HIV prevalence. If you look at other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa where the HIV, where the circumcision rate is less than 20%, you see there is a high HIV prevalence rate, which you're looking at above uh, uh, 20%. The same is not replicated in, uh, if you look at Southeast Asia, also you'll find the HIV prevalence is much lower in patients who have, uh, or in uh, countries where the circumcision rate is high. So basically telling us that uh, circumcision offers some protection with regard to HIV. Important for us when we are dealing with uh, circumcision is to understand the anatomy of the penis and the foreskin. We all remember the urethra, the glands, and uh, the prepuces. The idea is to excise the prepuces. It is good to note that um, in younger boys, you have physiological um, uh, prepucial adhesions. So you'll find the foreskin is attached to the glands. So while circumcising these younger uh, boys, then one has to separate or release this addition so that the prepuce is separate from the glands. As people get older, then you get uh, this uh, Propitial additions uh, getting lost naturally. What therefore are the benefits of circumcision? Uh, it is argued that uh, it is easier to keep the penis clean in a circumcised rather than an uncircumcised individual. It is reported that there is reduced risk of urinary tract infection in childhood in uh, boys who are circumcised. Uh, circumcision prevents inflammation of the glands and the foreskin and also definitely prevents uh, paraphimosis in the young boys because it's not uncommon to find younger boys retracting their foreskin uh, as they play and sometimes this gets stuck and doesn't go back. There is also reported reduced risk of uh, some sexually transmitted infections. Uh, we have already shown that this uh, evidence shows that there is reduced uh, risk of uh, 
HIV transmission in circumcised uh, males. And then uh, neonatal circumcision or childhood circumcision it has been shown in persons who practice uh, in areas where childhood circumcision is practiced, there's a reduced risk of penile cancer. And now there's emerging evidence uh, that there is a reduced risk of cervical cancer in female partners to those who are circumcised. So much for the benefits, what are the risks? Like all surgical procedures, there is pain. Uh, for our purposes today, uh, bleeding is one of the other uh, risks we encounter and indeed hematoma formation as alluded to earlier. All surgical uh, procedures can get infected. But aside from that, having exposed the glands, you can have increased sensitivity of the glands, which can last for a few days to a few months after the procedure. And uh, indeed, there may be an element of uh, irritation on the glands, which can last various durations. An inflammation of the meatus may also occur because this is a meatus which initially was covered and now it is uh, exposed. Injury to the penis is a common problem. It is not uncommon to find persons who have had amputation of the glands. Uh, poorly done or done by inexperienced people, there is a risk for urethral injury. And uh, following urethral injury, we can have fistulas developing, we can have hypospadias and epispadias also developing in uh, both circumcisions. We have also noticed uh, necrosis of the skin around, which sometimes we think is associated with uh, either infiltration of anesthetic. And in some situations, we actually don't understand why the necrosis of the skin occurs. So what are the important considerations? One, uh, circumcision requires to be performed as an elective procedure, because this is a procedure which is being performed on an otherwise healthy young man or boy uh, or indeed adult. So there's no reason for having it done uh, as uh, in, the, in the emergency setting. Because it's an elective procedure and cosmetic, then we have to always put client safety as a top priority. The persons who are performing the circumcision have to be competent. Unfortunately, our experience in this country is that most circumcisions are actually not performed by people trained to perform them, but people uh, who have watched um, others perform them. You will be surprised that as a urologist this year, I don't think I've performed more than two circumcisions, not because I don't want, but because the patients never get to us. So you will also have, uh, you'll also have experienced uh, a number of uh, church institutions and uh, uh, basically some sco schools organizing some circumcision camps. Uh, take note that these usually are not performed by uh, surgeons or urologists or indeed uh, people who are going through the necessary uh, formal training to perform these, to, uh, these procedures. It is good to note that circumcision needs to be performed in a properly equipped setup. Uh, it is, circumcision is one of the procedures when you look at it in the private setting, one can be, one can be informed that it can cost anything between 2,000 to 150,000 shillings. So you therefore start asking yourself, why is it that the cost is so variable? It is because of the setup in which it is performed. Those who will offer a very low cost for circumcision are probably performing them in their houses and uh, using uh, materials that are basically not very proper for the procedure. So in such circumstances, therefore, uh, they will not, they will not have a sterile environment, and indeed making it difficult to prevent infection. It is safer to perform circumcisions in theater where you have control of uh, where you, 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 you ensure sterility, uh, good lighting, and uh, you can prevent uh, any infections. 
it is also good to always have a trained assistant to one because it reduces the chance of contamination around there and indeed reduces uh, the stress on uh, retracting the penis from uh, side to side. Many people uh, treat circumcision as a very minor procedure, but I would like to emphasize that circumcision is not as minor as many people want to think about. When you look at uh, safety, it is good to always, like all other surgical procedures, to use the WHO safety surgery checklist. Uh, this ensures that on table we will have a person who is well prepared for surgery. One also has to be ready to manage any adverse events emanating from the circumcision. And this is what Dr. Kibet was uh, alluding to earlier. What are the principles therefore associated with circumcision? One, we have to be able to prevent infection. Uh, while planning the procedure, one needs to exercise an adequate, uh, one has to, uh, to exercise adequately the outer and inner propitious skin layers so that at the end of the day, we do not have uh, either excision of too much skin because that leads to shortening of the penis and pain during erection, or indeed leave too much skin because that will end up with uh, paraphimosis of some sort. For our purposes today, hemostasis has to be meticulous uh, because it is one of the only ways, therefore, we are going to prevent bleeding and indeed hematoma formation. The glands and the urethra have to be protected so that they are not uh, inadvertently injured during the process. A good cosmetic outcome is good for everyone um, so that we do not scare away partners. And indeed, this is an organ we all look at, uh, the males look at almost three to four times a day. We don't want to be looking at an awful sight. There are various techniques for performing circumcision, which have been described in a nutshell. Um, uh, forceps guided, uh, dorsal slits and that. Let me just use some diagrams to show. In this particular technique, this is uh, what we call the sleeve technique. And in the sleeve technique, we have a uh, marked out um, uh, a proximal and a distal uh, incision sites. Then the skin is excised, and then the skin edges are brought up together. This is a little bit more difficult to teach persons, but it's a very safe method because the glance is visible, and therefore one can avoid injury to the uh, glands and indeed the urethra. Another technique we commonly use is a combination of what is the dorsal slit. We make a dorsal slit here on the dorsum of the penis, and then you do a sleeve excision. Okay, in all this, once the excision is performed, meticulous hemostasis, and then we have the suturing of the skin edges, and we have a beautiful looking penis after the circumcision is completed. Uh, there is uh, another one, I'm sorry, I don't have that uh, slide here. What is called the forceps technique? Uh, the forceps technique can be done very fast. It is easier to teach persons. But unfortunately, in the forceps technique, uh, in this one, basically, the prepuce is, uh, there is traction placed on the prepuce. A forceps is clamped across the prepuce, and then the prepuce is excised. The trouble with this technique, uh, the forceps technique, is that if there are adhesions, then uh, the glance penis does not retract adequately, so it is easier to amputate the glance penis in the forceps technique. Another technique mainly used in children is the uh, use of uh, devices. In this particular slide, I'm showing what is referred to as plastibel here. Um, and in this technique, uh, you make a dorsal slit there, put in the plastibel, tie a suture uh, over it, and then excise the skin. The advantage with this uh, is that we have uh, early hemostasis. Actually, there is almost zero bleeding. But the trouble is there can be a risk of necrosis 
of the skin around there. And aside from that, uh, the presence of a foreign body here can lead to a lot of smell and indeed infection. But this is an, a procedure which is commonly uh, done by uh, the, those who circumcise children, not done in adult circumcision. What kind of local anesthetic do we prefer to use? For the purposes of adults, we prefer to use local anesthesia. Uh, but I must add, we can only use local anesthesia on those who can tolerate it. And the methods we use is a penile ring block uh, or um, uh, a dorsal nerve block. Why am I emphasizing on those who can tolerate? Because you do not want somebody kicking around uh, when performing the procedure. There is a high risk of injuring the glands or the urethra in someone who is not still. Some people have used local anesthetic sprays. Uh, they also do work. The only trouble is that in local anesthetic sprays, one has to be very patient, give the spray adequate time for the analgesic effects to the, the analgesic to take effect, you need at least 15 to 20 minutes for the uh, analgesia to take effect when you're do, using a local anesthetic spray. Is it, uh, we can also give general anesthesia on those persons who cannot tolerate uh, local anesthetic. Just a little illustration of the uh, dorsal penile nerve block. We do inject around 0.1 ml per kg body weight of local anesthetic. We prefer to mix uh, lignocaine and bupivacaine. And uh, this is injected around the trunk of the dorsal nerve. Uh, you can see uh, in this particular slide here, you can see the nerve running on either side. You have one on the right and another on the left. And then in between, you have the dorsal penile artery and vein. So we'll want to avoid injecting here in the midline because we don't want to put an aesthetic into the artery or the vein. So we inspect, look at the way the needles are angled, we inject laterally, okay? And we use the symphysis pubis as a landmark. And in the middle here, we'll have the suspensory ligament of the penis. So you are injecting on either side. A well-administered dorsal penile block is adequate to is adequate to anesthetize um, the penis for the purposes of circumcision. So this is just uh, a slide to show the mixtures we use. Like I mentioned earlier, we'd like to mix uh, lignocaine and uh, bupivacaine. So in conclusion, therefore, what are we saying? We are saying that surgical male circumcision is a cosmetic procedure and therefore should be elective best done under local anesthesia in those who can tolerate. However, you can use general anesthesia in those who cannot tolerate. While using uh, local anesthesia, we'll prefer the dorsal nerve block. And if that is not, if, 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 if one is not competent with, give it, with the performing a nerve block, then one can do uh, a ring block, which is basically an infiltration of local anesthetic around the base of the penis. We prefer to use the sleeve method uh, in our setup. And indeed, I personally prefer combining the dorsal slit and sleeve method because it allows me to visualize all the structures. I always perform mine with uh, an assistant uh, because it allows me to have better control of the procedure. I mentioned earlier about the forceps method and why it should be uh, avoided in the younger male or in boy, boys in particular. Gentle and accurate tissue handling reduces tissue trauma and its consequences, which are infection and hematoma. Um, we need to have good hemostasis and uh, for our purposes, we use vessel ligation or accurate diathermy, preferably bipolar as opposed to monopolar diathermy so that the current is concentrated on what one wants to coagulate. We must always aim to achieve a good cosmetic outcome. And this is best achieved by uh, suturing the cut edges. I prefer uh, to use uh, interrupted as opposed to 
a continuous suture line because it gives me better uh, cosmetic results. Thank you very much. Very much, Dr. Ikol. Um, and I can see that there are many questions. Um, and I'll start with a comment that was given by one of the attendees saying that, um, let's see, I think that was in the chat box. Thank you, Dr. Ikol. Surgical male circumcision is hardly taught in medical schools or even internship centers a basic procedure that is not given the attention that it deserves. Maybe you can speak on that as I uh, pick out some of the other questions on the surgical aspect that you have touched on. Uh, thank you very much for the comment. Um, it is true, um, I have a personal experience. I actually was not taught both in undergraduate and postgraduate. Is one of the one of those procedures you are left to read about, uh, see people doing it, and uh, I think mainly because there are a lot of competing, um, a lot of competing uh, pathologies one has to deal with in the surgical disciplines, and so circumcision was basically relegated. I can tell you for free that. Uh, as a young medical officer, when I started, when I came back to the city, one of the big hospitals, I was shocked to find a circumcision being performed by a specialist surgeon. I'd never seen this in my life. But anyway, uh, that is because of, uh, I mean, our practices, but it is good to note that uh, circumcision needs to be performed by highly qualified individuals. And uh, for us who are medical educators, we need to make sure that we teach people on how to perform a circumcision properly. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, a few questions to Dr. Kibet. Um, you already tackled the one on uh, making it an absolute contraindication. I think the emphasis is, um, Re recognizing that we live in a society where there are both cultural and religious expectations. And as Dr. Kibet mentioned, um, it's very interesting what you observe in the clinic, uh, that so the pressure actually comes from the patients themselves wanting to you know, feel like a, a, a man because this is a rite of passage. Uh, so Dr. Kibet, there's a couple of questions which maybe you can clarify on one. When preparing for circumcision, clarify if we routinely give concentrate. And then secondly, um, what blood products are preferred in hemophilia? And I think this is in response to a comment that's been raised by Dr. Chege from KNBTS. Thank you for attending. Uh, and she says, good session. If blood banks are roped in early, especially for elective procedures, FFPs, uh, cryo whole blood can be availed and prepared even as the hemophilia patients can await to receive factor concentrates. So maybe Dr. Kibet, you can speak to that because we have many participants here who um, uh, are from, you know, other institutions apart from KNH and may not have access to factor. What is the current position? What do we advise? Yeah, so thank you. Uh, I've actually been trying to respond to some of the questions online. Um, but what, what Dr. Chega has, requested, uh, has asked is very important. Um, so first of all, if you get a bleeder and you're not sure about the diagnosis, uh, our recommendation is you give fresh frozen plasma because the assumption is that uh, if uh, the patient is missing a coagulation factor uh, and you don't know which of uh, the coagulation factors are missing, we give FFP. Once you've confirmed uh, and determined the type of uh, bleeding, uh, let's assume it's hemophilia A, then we would recommend that uh, you give cryoprecipitate. And uh, you, know, you also recommend the use of tranexamic acid. Uh, the only contraindication there is when they see maturia. So tranexamic acid uh, can be given, uh, especially out there, together with the cryoprecipitate, 
or FFP. Um, the other thing is, uh, is it always a must that you use factor concentrates where you can have, you know, you can get some factor concentrates. The preference is use factor concentrates because you use small amounts, you have less exposure to unnecessary, you know, reactions and uh, you can contain bleeds much better. I don't know if that helps. Thank you very much. That helps. And uh, there's one question I'd like you to respond to before I uh, address a few to Dr. Ecole. Um, Hemophilia, Jehovah's Witness, and their management in case of excessive blood loss. So we have an anonymous at we are asking. So how we can support the Jehovah Witness? Um, I know they don't, uh, you know, believe in blood products or uh, blood. I think in general, but uh, we can use other uh, regimens, uh, and I think uh, we've talked about uh, other products that can be used. Um, depending on the type, again, we can actually use commercial products. Uh, I know I've not encountered a Jehovah Witness myself this far, uh, but we would tend to avoid use of uh, blood, uh, the, you know, blood components, as we all know, uh, cryos uh, or FFP, but then we can use uh, concentrates uh, and other uh, medical products uh, to support uh, the patients. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Ikol. There's a question, um, let me just see if I can get it. Uh, so there are a couple of questions on dressing. Um, one is about, please comment on your natal circumcision and do we dress the site post-op? Um, another similar question is um, uh, on, sorry, I'm just trying to get, uh, can a long time healed circumcision be revised to fashion a ventral skin tag in an adult? And then lastly, to comment on the use of lignocaine with adrenaline in circumcision. Okay, thank Dr. you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. I think I'll start with the last one. Uh, lignocaine, uh, no adrenaline, using um, adrenaline with circumcision. I mean, what, why, why would one want to use uh, adrenaline? Um, because I, I don't think it offers any uh, advantage when performing the procedure. However, I think it's good to understand the principles of um, the use of medications. And indeed, one of the one of the things that is commonly taught in uh, undergraduate or elementary medical schools is that one needs to avoid injecting a vasoconstrictive uh, chemical on an end organ. In this case, the end organs would be the finger. For our purposes today, the penis will treat it as an end organ. So once you inject uh, adrenaline, then of course, there is the risk of having a necrosis distal to your site of uh, injection. So for our purposes, I would like to advise that at all costs, avoid injecting adrenaline. If you have an issue of uh, poor control of hemorrhage, basically application of pressure, wrapping your hand around the penis would work well. It would give you, uh, it would be safer than uh, injecting any vasoconstrictors. Uh, the other one was, do you dress or shouldn't you dress? People practice different things. Personally, I prefer not to, to dress for the simple reason that um, on the ventral aspect, when the, when, the, when the male pees, you may get some uh, urine soaking, especially the frenulum area. So with the dressing, then you have that particular area getting soaked. So, and then uh, you'll also experience that uh, these dressings typically 
uh, a day after the circumcision, you'll find the penis has retracted back from the dressing and indeed the dressing is hanging. So my preference basically is uh, on the day one, I put a loose dressing, but advise the client that this dressing uh, either needs to be needs to be removed on the first or post post stop day if it doesn't fall off on its own, and then allow the person to apply uh, antibacterial cream on the wound. That is basically what I practice, and I see it works very well for me. Circumcision in newborns. I'm not sure I am competent to answer this one because uh, I am a urologist for adults. I wish there was a pediatric uh, uh, urologist around, but if there is none, I will attempt to answer uh, that there are uh, many communities, even in this country, who circumcise at a very early age, within the, uh, between the third and seventh post-operative day, mainly for cultural or religious uh, reasons. I find the organ too small to handle. So it's something I highly avoid, but if we have uh, any pediatric surgeon, maybe they can uh, uh, elaborate on it. Sorry, I can add. Yes. Is that uh, we actually recommend that circumcisions are done early in life. One is because of you know good and quick healing. Secondly, we use less factor concentrates and the costs tend to be much lower. So the tendency is to try and uh, support these patients as early as uh, possible in life. So, but again, this is not the common practice in a lot of setups. You know, the Muslims have done this for a long period and you know, they seem, it seems to work better even in terms of costs. There's uh, one um, additional question, uh, Dr. Ikol. I think uh, there's uh, one participant who's raised the issue now that uh, we are becoming a culture where people are very litigious. So uh, should we, I think I, there, there's a question about litigation and uh, whether, just trying to scroll here, uh, whether it's how uh, Dr. Kibet, I don't know, I saw you trying to address that question. Uh, one participant was concerned, you know, given that there's the risks of bleeding, this is something that uh, they can get lit litigated for. Is there a special indemnity for it? Um, but I think from your talk, one of the things that you've really talked about is having the right person do the procedure to avoid litigation, but maybe you'd want to comment about it more so that it's clear to everyone out there so that people don't shy off also from doing the procedure, but the message being that they do it the right way. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, for all, medical procedures, we do take a concept. One of the components of the concept is making the client aware of the risks associated with the procedure. So in this particular scenario, um, we have to make the patient acutely aware of the rest of the procedure they're going to go through. And indeed also um, advise them that on the mitigation uh, measures. And once it is clearly, uh, it is clear to the client that uh, uh, this is what can happen and uh, they sign for it, then you do not need any additional, any additional, any additional indemnity cover to perform the procedure because uh, it's basically a procedure like any other. But one has to have proper documentation that they have actually uh, discussed all those points with the client so that uh, at the end of the day, you know that the client has freely consented to what they know. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kibet, uh, do you have any parting uh, comments, even as we come to the close of this session? And I want to thank the participants who've been very uh, active on the chat section, putting out their comments and appreciating both of the presenters for uh, a wonderful talk, a very enlightening presentation. So. Dr. Kibet, uh, last comments, and then I'll give it to Dr. Ikol for final comments as well. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ari. Thank you to all our participants. I think uh, what I can say is uh, we should not uh, fear bleeders. Um, as uh, a profession, we should be able to confront this uh, disorder. And uh, if we all plan well, uh, it will be easier for us to have good time uh, because I know our surgeons have suffered out there especially due to lack of support. I think through Kenyatta National Hospital, we can be able to support our colleagues uh, wherever they are, either with diagnosis uh, or uh, preparations of these patients, including follow-ups for surgery. And, and I think we don't, need, we don't need to mobilize patients from wherever they are. We can take these services uh, closer to them. Thank you. Harry, Dr. Ikol. Thank you very much. Shot. Yeah, thank you very much, all participants. Um, circumcision is not as minor as we want to treat it. Uh, circumcision requires to be performed by those who are skilled in doing it. We should not shy away from uh, learning the right skills to perform a proper circumcision. Let us not shy away from performing the procedure of circumcision in an appropriate environment and uh, avoid um, performing circumcisions on, uh, on sitting room sofas or uh, beds in the bedroom. Let us perform it in a proper setup. Aside from that, uh, the multidisciplinary approach towards uh, circumcision is something which we really would like to to encourage so that our clients actually get the best out of what we can offer thank you thank you very much and i think that is uh, a very uh, appropriate way to end today's session remembering that we do not work in isolation we work as a team in one of the questions, uh, there was an issue question about the role of the nursing uh, team. They are very key in this and they did uh, a wonderful presentation yesterday. So the emphasis being let us support these patients well. Uh, it can be planned, it's not an emergency. Let us do it safely, let us do it rightly, and let's remember the team effort towards making this a safe process so that patients do not have complications. Thank you very much. Thanks for your participation and thanks for your time. Goodbye to all.